Thank you, Bill. Well, good morning. It's great to uh, see all y'all who braved the elements. Um, this is uh, kind of feeling like old time religion. Um, thank you all that are joining us uh, online. It's great to be with you this morning. Um, we're we're in the beginning of this series. God, can you hear me now? And, you know, you probably know where the Can You Hear Me Now comes from. It comes from a popular commercial where someone's, you know, walking around with their cell phone going, Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? And, and the whole point of that commercial is if you bother getting a cell phone um, and a cell phone carrier, you kind of want it to work. <laughs> I mean, what's the point of putting all that money down on a, on a cell phone and paying a monthly bill when you pick up the phone and it doesn't work. You can't get a signal. And I think that's fundamentally true with our conversation, our time with God as well. Um, we, if we take the time to put into prayer, we want it to work. We want, we, we, we want something out of it, if you would. And so one of those, those fundamental questions we asked, like Bill was praying last week, was, do you know the Father? Because prayer is about this relationship, and if you don't know the Father, well, it's probably not going to function the way you think it should function, just like any relationship. Most of us have some idea of God fixed in our minds that really comes less from direct revelation, comes less from God himself, and more from early encounters, uh, maybe with an earthly father, or even uh, the picture that a church or pastor may have given you. Uh, whatever the idea of God is in your mind, though, as you talk with him, it will influence how you communicate with him. The, the picture that is in your mind. It's entirely possible that there's people all over the world. It's probably not just possible. It's probably true. That are praying in the name of Jesus to a God that isn't even the God. That doesn't even reflect who Christ is. It's important to have a clear picture of who God is so that you know that you're communicating well and right. And you know who the one is that you're communicating with. Let me, let me give you an example. I think some folks, by the way, this comes from, uh, uh, this, this next session comes from largely from the book written by Larry Crabb called The Pop of Prayer. It's not my own doing. But um, I think a lot of folks have my, the my homeboy picture of God in the mind. And that's basically God is just like, you know, someone you hang out with. The problem is, is that if you think of God like a, just a smiling buddy, your prayer becomes nothing more than asking a favor of a chum. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with that because a chum's kind of inclined to you. The problem is a lot of times I don't ask a lot of times a favor from my chum when I'm really in trouble because he or she is just like me. They have the same problems, they have the same limitations, the same budget, the same ability or inability to solve the problem. So if your, if your view of God is he's just a chum, it's not such a great prayer life. Some folks have a view of God, and actually our early founders, a lot of folks don't know this, you know, talk about us being a Christian country, but a lot of the early founders um, weren't as Christian as you might think they were. And they had the view of God as the back room maker. The back room maker. What I mean by that is God made the world and now he's got other things to do. It's like he moved on to another universe. And this picture of God keeps him distant. And it results in a person basically resigning things that they simply are the way they are. And there's little hope for, for change. We've got to take it into our own hands. You know, God did his work. Got it going. Other folks have this view. It's kind of the similar, but it's a little bit different, of the preoccupied king, right? We sometimes picture God as this king who's got, he's got more important matters to worry about than, you know, what school we should choose for our kids or whether or not we should visit a dying father, someone who's sick and have, has COVID, if, um, if, you know, the, the, how my day might go or how a relationship I'd like to be in. Because, you know, God's, He's absorbed in other important matters like, you know, evangelism or crusades or political battles, you know, based on like abortion or things like that. Big, big problems. The, the next church plant, the next mega church, you know. 
The, the problem is that this picture of God makes our prayers feel small and petty and not worthy of a preoccupied king. So unless it's a big deal, why even ask? And believe it or not, I think a lot of folks have at least a tiny bit of this because those are the only prayer requests we ever get from you or from me. Right? Can I pray for you? No. But someone gets really sick. Oh, now you can pray because God must care about that one. Right? I lost my job. Well, you can pray for that one because God must care about that one. But all the rest of the details of life, well, I, don't, I don't really need prayer. Why? Because God must got, he's got better things to do. And then the, uh, another common one, and you often hear me refer to this as the Santa Claus version, but the vending machine is another way of looking at it. It's, I think it's, the, especially in the West, the most common image of God. We don't want to admit to, but we still kind of hold it, right? You just put in the coins and you collect the reward. The result, of course, is that when you pray, it's that as long as you pray right, it's like putting in the right change and hitting the right numbers. As long as you get that formula right, it works. The parking spot opens up. The lump disappears. The new job comes along. Let's pray more. Let's insert more coins. God is good. And, of course, the problem with this kind of prayer is... is you only use a vending machine when you're hungry, when you need something. That's not much of a relationship, is it? Now, many of us also have the view of God of the stern patriarch. That's what's in our minds when we pray. This one often develops because we had a father that was that way, very stern, very legalistic. It also develops because maybe we started at a very legalistic church. With this picture in our minds, God can be obeyed, but he's rarely enjoyed. Prayer is stiff, it's rigid, and a result of God being so far above us and very little of God with us. There's another popular view of God. Um, it really is more about modern ideas than really truly a biblical model. And I'm calling it the force. It's a popular new agey view of God. That God is an impersonal force. And yes, it comes straight from the idea of Star Wars. May the force be with you. God is going to do what God is going to do. A lot of times folks don't even call it God. They just call it the universe. Like there's some mystical mind universe out there that decides it's going to do what it's going to do. And if it happens, it happens. If you get cancer, you get cancer. It's what the universe decides. If it's your time, it's your time. It's what the universe decides. There's very little relationship. Again, it's more of a thing. The universe is more of a thing. The force is more of a thing than a person. And of course, the result then is really very little prayer. Especially if you believe in, the, in this view of, of karma, right? It's another way of kind of identifying the force. It's karma. But the, the problem with karma is, again, it's not relational. Karma is if I do good, I get good. If I do bad, I get bad. You don't need a relationship for that. You don't even need to talk to the universe. You don't need to talk to God. You just do good. You control it because it's all about what you do. It really has nothing to do with him at all. Another common picture in the church is the judge with a lightning bolt. You know, just waiting to strike you down. In this one, God hates mostly visible sins. That's really the ones we make a big deal about. Sins of culture like abortion, pornography, gambling, same-sex marriage, racism, adultery, on and on and on and on and on. And our prayers then to a theological stickler involves smugly joining forces with God to persuade other people of our views. It could be something as, as, as fundamental on, as pornography. It could be something as... Uh, very religious, like when Jesus is going to return and the mode of baptism. You know, how deep should the water be? Church structure. But at the heart of it, there's little concern for people's actual hearts. It's, what it's focused on is God's righteousness and avoiding his lightning bolt. Again, this, this does not draw people to the gospel and it doesn't draw us to God. 
Because again, prayer isn't, a, isn't about what God does in you. It, it's more of a, a plea that those other people get it together like me. You know that creates self-righteousness, right? That's a sin. And then lastly, again, another very popular one that's growing more and more, especially in our younger generation, is God is the lover. God loves us as individuals. I mean, what else needs to be said? What else really matters? I mean, he longs to satisfy our hearts, to communicate how profoundly he loves us so that we, so that I can feel valuable, so I can feel special, so I can feel cherished. And whatever uh, misery may come, I just run from it into the arms of my lover and he will make it all right because he just wants me to feel good. Now, with this understanding of God, prayer is reduced to a narcissistic yearning of self-worship. If that's, your, if that's your primary view of God, just that, it's self-worship. One who values the experience of, of internal satisfaction above all else. It's a picture of God. Now, each one of these distorts prayer into something other than relating to God who, for who he really is. It, and it's also kind of a, a picture of, you know, you've probably heard the example of all the blind folks, and they all have a piece of the elephant, and they're all arguing about what an elephant's like. One has the ear, and it's, you know, it's thin and smooth, and one has the tail, and it's really long and skinny, and one has the trunk, you know, it has all these muscles and moves around, and one has the, the leg, and one has a hand on the body, and... They're all saying, this is an elephant. And in one hand, they're all right, but fundamentally, they're all wrong. And that's what's a view, that's what's the problem with the, these different views is, yeah, they have a hand on a small aspect of who God is, but fundamentally, they're wrong. How do you picture God, or do you picture God when you pray? And so once again, I'll ask you, do you? You know the Father. Now let me just tell you up front. The Bible won't let us pin God down to one image that we can be comfortable with. God is at once endearing, furious, sensitive, other, playful, holy, welcoming, terrifying, responsive, and unpredictable. Many of his characteristics are often in, in such a way that we cannot easily just call him daddy. If you remember last week, one, one of the passages we started with was found in Genesis 18 when, when the Lord and a couple angels came to visit Abram. And it says in verse 2 that, that Abraham hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet him and he bowed low to the ground. Now there are two things that are going on simultaneously there. The first is this excitement. The Lord is here. And he rushes out. And that's the picture that we really tried to paint last week. The picture of father, the picture of daddy, the picture of the one who is for you. Who's just as excited about being with you as you are with being with him. But there's a second thing going on here. Because as he rushes out to meet his Lord in excitement, as soon as he gets to him, he hits the ground and bows down. By the way, the word worship literally means bow down. He worships him. In human terms, let me, let me put it this way. Um, I want my kids to know that I love them dearly. And I want the best for them. And I will sacrifice my time my treasure, my talent, so that, so that they can experience God's best in their life. I strongly desire for them. However, and they will tell you this, they also need to know that I am not just their friend. They cannot talk to me like they do their homeboy. They are not allowed to say, Dad, talk to the hand. Uh-uh. No way. I love you, I'm for you, but I expect respect. Right. 
as your father. Now, being a dad, like being a mom, involves both these things. It, it, it involves familiar affection as well as authoritative discipline and respect. And God is no different. Okay, he's different. He's absolutely different. But in terms of the principle, it's not different. Except that in the case of God, he really is always right. I mean, the, the truth is, and my kids will tell you this, sometimes what I think they should do, I mix a little me in there. It's not absolute truth. It's, you know, mostly true with a little bit of dad mixed in there. But God is always right. And not only that, he isn't just father, the father. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And he is the master. Unequivocally. And if you don't understand this principle, you will get frustrated because you will not truly know God. You must know both sides. Let me explain it in another way. I want you to think of one of the 12 disciples, John. All right? Now, John, one of the disciples, had such a close relationship with Jesus. When he wrote down his experiences with the Savior, when it got to talking about himself, he says, he didn't just say, and, you know, Jesus said this to me. He said, Jesus did this to the disciple whom he loved. That's how he referred to himself. I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, on one hand, you, gotta, you know, that's, that's kind of brave. But on the other hand, you got to go, wow, man, he really felt like he connected with Jesus. Now, I want you to remember what the writer of Hebrews says, chapter 1, verse 3, that he declares that Jesus, Yeshua, is the exact representation of God's being. So if you want to know who the Father is, what the Father's like, look at Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. The visible Son, Jesus, is a mere uh, image of the invisible God. And one great advantage of the fancy word incarnation, which basically means God in human form, is that we now can see God. Just look at Jesus. Okay, back to John now, all right? Now, how do you think John saw Jesus? How do you think John looked at Jesus? After all, John was the one that when they were having dinner, he got to rest his head comfortably on Jesus' chest. He was asked by Jesus on the cross to care for Jesus' own mother. Can you imagine being the one Jesus asked to do that? Would you take care of my mom? He had a special fish lunch along with the other disciples with Jesus by the sea after his resurrection. And he had a front row seat with Jesus when he was lifted off the ground and floated into the clouds. And when the angel said, just like he's disappearing, he will come back. Yeah. Now, if you ask John what he visualized when he prayed, I suppose it would have been one of these images. Jesus was familiar to John. He was the one who loved John. However, decades later, John got a glimpse of Jesus that was different. Because he kept continued to talk about Jesus and preach about Jesus and share Jesus, he was put on the island of Patmos as punishment. And on that island, um, God showed him a clear vision of what is in the future. The things that are, that are to come. The things that, in some cases, were going on at the time. And this is what he records in Revelations chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. John says, As I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now this reflects the lampstands that were in the temple. He is in heaven. Probably in the temple in heaven. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. So now we're talking, we know he's talking about Jesus, the, the prophecy that we see in Daniel that's fulfilled in Jesus. So he sees someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. This is someone special. 
His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. On his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Now I want you to notice verse 17, his response. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. This image of Jesus glorified in his, in his heavenly form, if you will, in his divine form, was overwhelming to John. And so he fell over as if dead. Then he placed, Jesus placed his hand on me and said, do not be afraid. You know why he said that? Because he was afraid. He'd always had this picture of Jesus, you know, this, the, the, the rabbi who's respected and loved, the master, absolutely. But man, this picture of Jesus, he had never seen before, and he was afraid. Jesus says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold, notice this, Jesus says, I hold the keys of death. And Hades. Hades, by the way, is where we get our word hell, our English word hell. That's the picture of Jesus. I hold the keys of death and hell itself. Now, let me ask you here. Do you think maybe John prayed differently after this experience? Absolutely. Because his picture of Jesus changed dramatically. He got a sight of of the divine aspect of Christ. Not just the miraculous aspect. We like that aspect. But the otherness, the awesomeness of him. So let me ask you again. Do you know the Father? Do you understand that he is not just familiar, but he is other? If you want to learn about prayer... Really, the, the best way that I know of is, is, is that you sit in on someone who prays a lot and well. The problem is, is that most people who pray really, really well do in the privacy of their own home and closet. You don't ever get to see it. The next best way that I, I know of is, is obviously going to the scriptures, especially <clears throat> to the Psalms. Because it's a book of worship. It's a book of prayer to kind of see how different folks throughout time interact with God. And so I just want to highlight a few. I, I don't have time where I can go through a lot, but I just want to highlight a few things so you can get an aspect of how people interacted with these two aspects of God. Kind of like the, the gals are doing on Wednesday evening as they go through the Psalms and what it means to pray with the Psalms. So Psalm 74, uh, I'm sorry, 147. <clears throat> this comes from um, a psalmist. Uh, uh, someone who's singing and praising and, and, and saying, listen, God brought us, this is when God brought them back out of Babylon. And he's beginning to restore them to Jerusalem. And it says this, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exile of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. This is a wonderful picture as God restores them. But, but I want to remind you that <clears throat> the folks that are returning, um, they had lost loved ones in this invasion. They were in a foreign land, and, and many of them were, were much, not much better than slaves, and they were returning to a devastated land and ruined houses. And so in verse 5 of Psalm 147, the psalmist says this, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Why, why does he declare God's understanding has no limit in the midst of this kind of God restoring us? Why? Because this whole situation was beyond their understanding. God, why would you allow COVID? All this suffering economically and health and the breakup of families who, who can't visit somebody when they're in the hospital and, and, and very sick and some even dying. Why, why God? Why God? Why God? But in the midst of a prayer, just like that, we go, but God, you, you have understanding that has no limit. 
It's reminding ourselves, even though I don't understand, even though I couldn't put it all together, God can and will. If you don't have that aspect of God, though, it's just depressing. Psalm 74, talking about uh, uh, this is when God's people are, are, they've turned away from God. By the way, a lot like Christians have in the West. Not the West, Christians have in the West. And, and their society is beginning to take a turn for the worse. Sound familiar? And the psalmist writes this in uh, Psalm 74. Why have you rejected us forever, O God? Notice the depth of the feeling. Why does your anger smolder against the sheep of your pasture? Remember the people you purchased of old, the tribe of your inheritance, whom you redeemed, Mount Zion, where you dwelt. Can you, can you feel the angst? The raw emotion, the, the God, I want to be honest. Remember we talked about that last week. Be honest. But note, but note in the middle of this psalm, starting in verse 13, though, notice also that the psalmist reflects on the character of God. It was you, God, who split open the sea by your power. You broke the heads of the monster in the waters. It was you who crushed the heads of the Leviathan and gave him food to the creatures of the desert. It was you who opened up springs and streams. You dried up the ever-flowing rivers. The day is yours and yours is also the night. You established the sun and moon. Here is the psalmist pleading for God's help as his people are experiencing the natural consequences of their actions. But in the midst of this prayer is a reminder of the power, the absolute power of God. Your prayers change when you remember the one whom you're speaking to created all that was in existence. And he has the power literally to do anything he wishes. Your prayers change. Like the psalmist 139 who understands God is everywhere. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? I can't. When we feel alone and isolated, it's good to remember that God is everywhere and present at all times. Do you understand that about your God? You understand he knows exactly what is being said behind closed doors in politics. He knows exactly the intentions of the Koreans. He knows exactly the intentions of, of, the, of big pharma, big government. He knows exactly the intentions of us little folk. God is everywhere. And we are never alone. We are never forsaken. And back to the previous point, he has the power to weave it all together. And the understanding to know how to do it several generations before it even matters. The psalmist, uh, Psalm 130, I love the depth of this prayer. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. It's just, this is anguish. It's, 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 it's the cry of someone who's like, God, I knew what was right. I chose what to do wrong. I reveled in what was doing wrong. Now it's got me by the throat. It's pulling me down. I deserve it. I need your mercy. Honesty. And then later on in verse 7, he writes this, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. Why? Why can I put my hope in the Lord? I deserve this. For the Lord is, has unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. His heart is to bring us back into himself. His heart is that he has unfailing love. He never quits on us. That's the God we have. That will change your prayers if you understand that aspect of God. As a matter of fact, it'll cause you to pray because many times I don't want to go to God because I'm like, it, it, God can't re receive me right now. I am stuck in this and I am angry and I want this thing and I don't want him to change me, so why go to God? But if I understand, first of all, God already knows that. It's not like I'm going to tell him anything he doesn't already know. And second of all, God understands the human heart. And he'll take me just as I am, even in my rebellion. If I'm willing to come to him and just say, God, I feel rebellious right now. The psalmist cries out in Psalm 44, verse 25, We are brought down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us, God. But in the midst of the psalm, he writes this in verse 6, 
I do not trust in my bow. My sword does not bring me victory. But you give us victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. See, he, he understands that we are broken. We have nowhere to go. But in the midst of this, he reminds himself of God's character. The God is faithful and he is the source of blessing. Here's, here's the thing for you and I. For, and I'm totally guilty of this. I'll often go to God and I'll ask God to bless my plans, to bless my abilities. In other words, I'll say, God, I have this sword. I have this, uh, this uh, uh, bow. Make me really good with it. Me, 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 me. And then I get the, I ultimately at the end of that, I mean, God help me, but I get the glory. But if you have a view of God that the psalmist does here, your prayer is different. You understand that I don't make the money. I'm not the one that makes myself lovable. I'm, the, I'm not the one that can change someone's heart where we can be reconciled. I'm not the one that controls the economy. God is the faithful one. It's by his hand that we experience blessings in this life. I approach him differently. Do you know the Father? Do you know the Father? See, we often don't experience God because we don't know him. And because we don't know him, we either don't pray or we turn prayer into something that was never meant to be. And so it's ineffectual. Lastly, I want you to remember this. When Moses tried to pin God down just to a name, Forget pinning down God generally, just to a name. God's answer in Exodus 3 was, I am who I am. I'm not definable. I cannot be completely understood. Remember that in Revelation we're taught that there's four living, interesting creatures that day and night declare holy, meaning other Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We cannot contain him. We cannot understand him. As soon as you think that you've got him figured out, you, then he's no longer God. If you can limit him, if you can understand him, if you can contain him, that's a demigod at best. Not a God. A true God. Isaiah encourages people to both pray, but he reminds them who they are. This is what he writes in Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9. He says to the people, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and God will have mercy on him, and he will freely pardon. Pray. Ask so that you may receive. But in the midst of this, call to pray, call to draw close to a loving, generous, faithful God is this reminder. And it comes from God himself. It's in quotes from the Lord speaking. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. That, by the way, isn't by a little. Otherwise, he would say, as the treetops are higher than the ground. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts. My ways of doing things are higher than yours. You really think, you really think I, as a human pastor, can really sit here and go, man, I got this, just here... Here's the Bible. I'll tell you what it is. I got it figured out. Here's the plan. Talk about the blind leading the blind. That's why I do my best to say this is God's word, but the Holy Spirit's got to infuse it and lead it to places way beyond what I can imagine or think. When we go, when we get to know the Father, our prayers... They don't get answered because we found the magic prayer formula. You know what? Teach us how to pray, Pastor, right? How do I, I get in there and I, I, I give him a daddy, okay? Got that one. And then, but you know what? I mean, he needs to be respected. So I throw in there and God Almighty, right? And then I, I better confess a sin or two. That's really impressive. 
You know, when we understand that we're a sinner and he's now confess, confess some, some things. Oh, wait, I forgot. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it's all about him. Now, let me get to it. Wait, wait, before I get to it, let's pray for a couple other people so he knows I don't just care about myself. Bless her, bless him. They're really sick. All right, God, now, I think you're ready. What I really need is a raise. A spouse. Peace, whatever it may be. Thanks, Pastor. That was what I was looking for. I got the formula now. When you really get to know God, prayers don't get answered because you found a magic prayer formula. But rather, because when we know the Father, the personal and almighty God, our prayers actually change. Our prayers actually change. And when our prayers change to reflect the Father that we know, they begin to reflect the Father's will. And you know what I can tell you absolutely 100% about the Father's will? It's always done. Yeah. Always. And that, that is, gets you to a place where you don't have to go, God, can you hear me now? Because God goes, I hear you loud and clear. That's right. That's right. May it be. Right. Next week, we'll talk about one of the major blockers of our prayers. Pray with me now. Father God, I thank you for your love, dear God. That you are a loving, good, good father who knows how to give good gifts to his children. Who loved us so much that you sent your son, Jesus. Who submitted himself even to death on a cross for our sake. Thank you for that kind of love. Thank you. That for Jesus' words, it says, I now call you friends, not servants, but friends. At the same time, dear God, help us reflect the attitude that so many in the Bible knew you, who knew you reflected, dear God, that you are to be worshipped, that you are to be feared. You are not a tame God. Even Jesus himself modeled God, I would like this, but may your will be done. God, I know if you fully revealed yourself, we would die. We definitely would, would fall down to the ground in fear and trembling, overwhelmed. And so I pray, dear God, um, that we may experience you in the, in the little bit that we can handle. In your, in your glory, as well as your familiar parts, dear God. And we may get to know the real and full you, dear Lord. Break down those barriers, dear God, because I know that's why you sent Jesus in the first place. And I pray this week as folks just try, dear Lord. I know it doesn't happen all at once, but as folks just step out in faith and try, that you may give them early successes. Not that their prayers may be answered, but that their time with you may be rich. I pray this in the name of our God, Yahweh. Of the spirit who lives within us, Numa. And of the son, Jesus, Yeshua, who is the Christ. Amen, amen. and amen. God bless. We'll see you all next week.